are you, Dr. Abdo? Shall I call you Dr. Abdo or Armia? Uh, you can call me Ar- Armia. It's fine. Armia? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Armia. It's so nice to have you back on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So since we last spoke, there's been a lot of changes on your end. And, you know, you're a physiotherapist. And I wondered, you know, what you think have become issues that have become exacerbated since the pandemic for people? Uh, Yeah, there's been quite a few things. Um, Number one, it's like uh, the typical aches and pains that people get with their uh, with sitting at work and being sedentary have amplified. And one of the reasons for that is because um, people aren't taking the same breaks that they were before. Their, their home setup is not as refined as uh, that they would have at work. So there's a few issues like that that have, um, I think, just increased the same problems we we're dealing with. But there is one additional increase that I've seen as well, too, is people's stress levels have definitely gone up. And of course, there's a high correlation between uh, how somebody feels and their mood in regards to how their body feels as well. You know, we're a complete system, so it's impossible to separate those things and uh, to imagine that they don't have an effect on each other. Right. Oh, I really wanted to ask you about that. I, um, you know, sometimes when I, when, when you hear something constantly on the media, you know, stress levels are going up, stress levels are going up, but um, and then you have, you know, all the generations who think, well, we've been through much worse. We've been through wars before. And, you know, it's just that what you're going through, you guys are weaker. Um, so then I try to kind of put things into perspective and, and uh, not over dramatize. But do you think that we are dealing with stress, a lot more stress and, and we're just unable to cope? What do you think about the stress we're dealing with? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, you know, because, uh, you know, my my dad was an immigrant, too. So he's in that generation where, you know, unless you're dying, you don't go to the hospital. Everything's fine. You know, <laughs> so um, part of part of how you handle stress is, is unique to the person, because, you know, think of our body as a system that absorbs stimulus and our and our brain decides and our neurological system decides how we process that stress. And then there's an output. So stress, uh, how you manage it is individual to the person. But one thing that's unique to our generation compared to the generations before is that we're inundated with so much information. So we're on information overload, and that is fatiguing for our neurological system. So our ability to process information is is that system is overwhelmed as compared to the generations before. And you can even see that with our ability to uh, produce and do work. Even though the generations before us were were tough, our production and the amount of work that we do in our generation is is tenfold. You can even see that in regards to like uh, um, the economics, like the GDP of a country, like how much we're producing. So we produce so much because we can do so much in such a little time. Mm -hmm. So our stress levels are significantly higher as a result of that. And it's almost breaking that system of our body. And, and that system becomes glitchy. And that glitchy looks like depression, anxiety, increased inflammatory markers. So all of those things leave an imprint on our physical body. Right. And so what I see is uh, the same issues as before, of course, using technology, the position you're in, your postures, but they're manifest or they're multiplied because of the increased stress level. Right. So I definitely agree with you. I think you know, being constantly inundated by information. But what I think people don't understand is your role, for example, as a physiotherapist, people assume that you would only be dealing with the body. Yes. You, and uh, you just abuse us of, of that understanding of how we see physio. And those are, those are fixed ideas that, that, again, maybe come from the generation before and, and in the past. Uh, so if you think about physi- physiotherapists, um, we've evolved since about the 50s, right? Before we were just uh, a, a hybrid of nurses working with people with polio. Mm-hmm. You know, so we've evolved as a profession. And the more we learn, our education level has gone up. Now all of the physical therapists uh, or physiotherapists are all at a doctorate level. So our understanding of the human body as a whole and different systems of the body and how they affect each other um, have increased. So as a result, our scope of practice, our knowledge, what we can do for people has increased as well. 
but some people, they have the, the same ideas that we're doing the same thing we did 20, 30 years ago, which mm-hmm. is not true, mm-hmm. you know, but why people think that. Um, but it's important that they realize that a lot of us have advanced in our ability to care for people's physical health. And we understand the relationship of all the other systems of the body and how it affects your physical health. So as a result, it has to become part of our, our treatment plan. And it has to be something that we're aware of and that we discuss and educate with our patients. Right. Um, so let's take myself, okay, just to, to kind of get an understanding. If I came to you and I said, actually, I, my neck is causing me a lot of pain. Um, I'm on my phone a lot. I'm definitely ad- addicted to screens a lot more than when we spoke two years ago. And I thought I was bad pretty then. Yes, <laughs> um so i i've actually become aware that if i'm having stressful thoughts this part of my neck gets even worse um so how would you then help me figure out how i can fix it but also what's causing um how all of this is interrelated yeah that's a concept i like to think of as like criminal and victim Right. So the neck pain is, is the victim. And who's a criminal? What's the cause? You know, and uh, so in regards to just the physical health or, or just your musculoskeletal system, it's uh, it's dynamic. We have to look uh, my analysis starts all the way from the feet all the way up. And by and, and typically the first day I would, would look at somebody's uh, posture and I would treat them from the ground up. And what I find is by the time I get to the neck, if I've treated everything underneath it, half, if not more of the symptoms are gone. So that helps us prioritize and let us know that, hey, your foot posture, your pelvic posture, your, um, the way you're holding your mouth, all those things are contributing uh, to your neck pain. So that cause and effect related to the musculoskeletal system. Now, specific to you and actually some of the other patients that I treat uh, that are on high stress um, type of jobs is that, okay, their posture affects their neck but their stress is also a cause and the effect of that stress is neck pain. So we have to work on stress management, but some of them, unfortunately, they're in jobs that they can't give up and they can't leave. So we understand that we're, we're putting out a fire that's going to keep happening. So we're managing their care while we try to help them figure out how to manage their stress level. And if it gets beyond our scope of practice, then that's where we can start um, referring out to other uh practitioners that specialize in stress management. So this is where collaboration is very key because there's many causes that lead to the same effect. So our ability to fix it really depends on what the major cause is. Uh, But of course, our goal is to fix it, but we have the education to understand when we need to outsource some of the other treatments as well too. So you're saying, let's say I am uh, someone who works in the finance industry and every time there's movement in the stocks, I'm like super crazy. I'm going really high stress job. Um, you're saying literally you could treat that. You could um, teach them what they need to do to fix whatever cramps and issues that they have in their body. But because of this job, they would literally need to come back the whole time. Yeah, we end up having to manage it. So they, because the stress level that's coming to their job is, is, is too great, you know, to overcome. So we're, now here's, here's the unique thing though, is that uh, one of the things I do with a lot of my patients is education. So once people understand the process of that stress being absorbed in their body, and then they, they, their brain's trying to figure out what to do with that stress. And unfortunately the output is neck tension. So just the fact that they, they, they learn the fact that that's how it works, that alone sometimes can help resolve the problem. Right. You know, so a lot that we can do without having to send to somebody else. Um, right. But if it becomes something that is so damaging to them, then of course we want to get additional support and help. Uh, but you'd be surprised awareness is amazing. So just the people who understand that, like, look, it's, you don't have a chronic problem. Your body is just trying to absorb all of the stimulus. And for some reason, the output is going up in your neck. So it's like you're not filtering the stress properly. So we look for different outlets. And a lot of times it's exercise and movement because movement helps. And when you're stagnant, you're absorbing a lot of stress. 
it, it overwhelms the system. So there usually needs an outlet and that requires a change in how you do things. And some people are capable, others are not, you know, so we try to educate them and make everybody capable of changing the way they do things. Right. And I got a lot from our podcast last time, um, but it's still really, really hard. So there are weeks when, let's say, I haven't had time to exercise or let's say I'm working on writing a lengthy piece of something. It's really hard to remember, um, you know, what we discussed, which is constantly, if you're holding your neck in a certain position, make sure you hold it in the other position. And just yeah. those simple things that we talked about. That's really um, when you're in the grip of something, or let's say you've been working straight for several hours without any movement, it's really hard. Um, and we talked last time about, so the, I know a lot of people who listen to this podcast go to the gym and are into weight training. So yes. do you find people who are athletes and um, you know, lift heavy weights if they don't learn these tools, end up with those kinds of chronic pain. Oh, yes. Uh, and part of the reason for that is uh, fitness doesn't guarantee health. And freedom of movement in your body, good postural health, uh, proper alignment, uh, all of that can be helped with fitness, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee it. So it's really important to have a balanced system of your body. A uh, side effect of a lot of fitness or strength training is stiffness. You know, so if you don't have some type of balancing act with it, then you're going to get to the point where you get so stiff that you start to lose your functional movement and your strength. Uh, so it gets to the point of like diminished return. It's like medicine, right? If you have too much medicine, you increase side effects. Yes. So you have to have a balanced system. Right. And if I can touch on the point that you mentioned earlier about uh, when you're doing a lot of work, right, and you get in the zone with things. Yeah. And um, what I found is, you know what, sometimes we have to cater to different parts of ourselves. And if you're in the zone and you, and you have a proper flow going and you're extremely creative, uh, sometimes we have to sacrifice a little bit of our health for that, as long as we don't break anything and then we, we in turn go back and heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with... Uh, with doing a lot of work at the consequence of our, our physical body, because our, our body has a lot of health and it's very resilient. So even though you cause some pain and discomfort, if you do the right thing, simple solutions, you can overcome those problems and reset yourself and return to your homeostasis. The problem is when people are always in the zone and they constantly ignore their body, the, the body will only get louder and louder until you get to the point where you can't ignore it. And unfortunately, that's when most people seek help once they've crossed the line where it's like their body won't quiet down or if they want to keep going, they just take medication to dull that, dull mm -hmm. that uh, noise so they can keep going. But unfortunately that leads to a point where uh, they break and then you need larger interventions from there. That's surgeries, injections, medications. So it's important that we see these problems coming so we don't get ourselves in trouble. Right. Um, so staying on that, what do you think are the biggest body issues that people come to you for? I would say, I would guess knee problems, but mm -hmm. which, which body part do you think mostly gets neglected and then ends up breaking down or we end up coming to you for? Well, typically it's the low back and the neck. Oh, but I, I like to think of those as uh, the, the victims. Those are the biggest victims. And the reason for that is because they're capable of doing a lot and they're capable of compensating for a lot of other body parts. But in regards to what are the, the criminals that usually cause it, it's always the feet. The, the feet are the biggest thing. It's your foundation. Uh, an example of this is imagine you keep, a, you have a, a two-story home and you keep seeing that there's cracks in the second story. So you keep fixing it, you keep fixing it, but you end up finding out that the the foundation is crooked. And as a result of that, the second story can't absorb the same type of stress and things break. So think of your back and neck as the second story, the third story. So it's all about the foundation. And if you're constantly in a crooked position, your back is capable of compensating for it. So a lot of us, we get angry at our backs and necks thinking that they're the problem, but they never cause their own pain. It's usually the supporting structures underneath it that put it in a compromised position. 
So that's why it's really important that we treat the whole body. But unfortunately, a lot of our healthcare systems are what I call reactive care. And you just go running towards the loudest body part. Your back hurts, we treat your back. And yeah, that puts out the fire, but doesn't fix the problem. So it's important that we have a holistic type of care. Right. Okay, so talk to us about feet, because I think I literally know nothing about feet. (laughs) Um, I'm assuming, especially for someone like me who likes to wear high heels, and I need to educate myself a lot about that. Well, you know, it's interesting. So a lot of us, when we play sports as a kid or just recreationally, uh, mm-hmm. we all have suffered ankle sprains. Yes. You know, and, and but it's one of those body parts that, okay, we get it, but nobody ever seeks help for it unless it's really bad. You just walk it off. Yeah. But every time that happens to you, it's like, um, it's like imagine tires on a car. It's just a flat tire and it gets flatter and flatter. And then the alignment gets off. That's your low back. Everybody's like, oh, my pelvic is always, cro- my pelvis is always crooked, one leg longer than the other. Well, a lot of that has to do with your foot posture. And then on top of that, we wear these shoes that really alter our foot and the way it, the way it bears weight. So instead of our, using our foot properly, uh, we just have a slight variation in tilt. And if you know anything about like how the body functions, is that small variations in our posture alignment have significant effects on how the system works as a whole. You can even see that on your foot right now. If you push your feet into the ground, you can tell how the energy travels up and which muscles get triggered. So if your foot tends to be on the outside and you push the side of your foot down, what gets tight? The side of your calf, your IT band, the side of your hip. So it changes the way our body works. Our foot is like the, the first domino. And if it, if it goes right, it, it creates a proper sequence. And if it doesn't hit the ground right, Uh, we compensate. And so the compensations look like knee pain, back pain, neck pain. It it really uh, depends on the person and what they do. But the cause is always the same. The symptoms can vary depending on the person. That's really interesting to say that because... An additional thing... Yeah, additional thing you can look at... Sorry to interrupt. um, You can look at the wear patterns on your shoes. Well, You know, so if you... Uh, the wear patterns, like how, how beat up your shoes are. So if you have one side of your foot or one shoe is really worn on the outside, that means you put a lot more pressure on the outside of your foot as compared to the other side. So that's where the asymmetry starts. And then if you have asymmetry at the feet, you have to be balanced somewhere in the hips, and then you have the zigzag pattern all the way up. What should it be? What's the ideal way that our feet and our shoes should look? Uh, well, number one is that they should be symmetrical. That's really key. Even even if you're a little bit offset, if you're symmetrical, it's better than if you're asymmetrical. Okay, so that's number if, one. Because we all have different feet uh, shapes. Like I have a super high arch. So yes, and that may come from uh, from wearing the high heels. You know, because if your foot's pointed and it's curled. That, that could be a compensation as well, too. But some people have various types of arches. But the key is symmetry. And then the second part is we need to have a lot of our weight bearing be on our big toe. Our big toe is twice as big, about four times as strong as the other toe. So it needs to be the one to uh, initiate movement. But a lot of people, they have bunions, so their toe curls in, their foot t- tilts out, and that takes their big toe out of Sorry, They have what? Uh, the, they have bunions, right? So the toe will dive in and then the whole foot will be tipped to the outside. So what that does is it takes your big toe out of play. So your big toe is no longer able to touch the ground and you can't ground yourself properly and use it. So if your big toe is not being used, then your body just from the beginning is already compensating. So it's going to torque your knees, torque your pelvis and all the way up the chain. So if that is not corrected, how do they how do people come to have these problems is it shoes the wrong shoes uh well it's a it's a combination of things uh wrong shoes is one of them but typically we put like even babies in shoes right away you know we put them in these shoes with a a small toe box so jams our toes together yeah and so we, we we take somebody's foot and their ability to ground and connect to the ground and we squish them together and then they get ankle sprains so then they start to tip to the side and then they have tight hips from sitting a lot. So then the whole pelvis tips out. So their feet become more and more deficient. And we get further and further away from the inside of our arches and our big toes. 
So if you have feet like that, I mean, you can easily see that in your shoes and how it wears. But it's really, if you don't fix that, you're going to have chronic problems that aren't going to go away like they should. Oh my God, I just feel like... But they're not symptomatic. That's the problem. Nobody ever walks in, hard, like hardly anybody walks in and points to their feet. People only point to what hurts. And what hurts doesn't guarantee that you're going to fix the problem. And that's why it, it's, uh, it's really on a lot of physiotherapists to do the proper analysis to, to treat what dysfunctional not just what hurts what you're saying is so radical because if the problem starts with our feet and i'm just thinking of you know i started wearing heels i think when i was 12 so and so apparently so you think that would have contributed to me having the arch that i have which then affects my back and gives me other postural issues and how many of us are walking around with shoes that are not um, right for or can correct, you know, wrong feet? <laughs> oh, all of us. That's why when you see stats that say at any given point in time, like uh, in America, 50% of people have muscle and joint pain, you know, and, and that's like 170 million people and about a third of the world. And those are just the ones who report it. At first, when I saw that stat, I was like, ah, oh, that's way too many people. But then I started thinking, do I know anybody who doesn't have any aches and pains? I was like, no. So then I started to realize that that may be an, uh, a lower estimate. And part of the re reason is, the reason we all have similar aches and pains is because we're all living somewhat similar lives. We all are sedentary for work. We all have uh, shoes that maybe don't don't work right. We uh, the second we start our education, we're sitting all the time rather than moving. Yes. you know our work. A lot of us work tremendous amount of hours, so we're not seeing the physical movement, not even seeing daylight. You know, so you couple all these things together, and you have uh, chronic pay aches and pains, and people who are depressed and not feeling well. And I think COVID has changed the way we do work. I think a lot of people are waking up to these things and their tolerance for it has is, is gone down. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people don't necessarily want to return to their workplace. They want the freedom to move, yeah. you know, and the freedom to be outside when they need to, because they've, they've seen how important it is to their health. And once you see that, you can't go back. Yeah. You know, so it's really on a lot of our um, decision makers out there to realize that and to complement that by changing the way we do things. And that's what COVID's really done. It's really yeah. changed the way we do things and opened up our eyes to a lot of things that, you know, we shouldn't be tolerating. What do you think, um, cause you work with companies, right? Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the things that you would recommend to companies to help, you know, their workers keep healthy? Well, uh, so that is actually the, the foundation of, of our company and what we're doing. So when you, uh, number one is that in the past, if you want to do employer health or employee health, you would have to send a lot of people down to the office. You'd have to analyze people. That's very disruptive to the workflow of people. Um, so they're not too interested at that point in time. And some of them may or may not have problems, right? So it's just not the best fit. And it requires a lot of time. And most people don't want to spend the time. And like you said, they're addicted to screen time, yes. right? So if you're going to make an impact for somebody, you have to get in front of them. And the best place to get in front of them is, is where they're addicted is, is with screen. So with our uh, technology and our app, we're able to analyze their postural health with just a selfie, with a picture. And that doesn't disrupt their workflow. We don't have to send anybody there. It's fully AI and automated. So that's, that's a, a significant benefit. And because of that, the cost for our platform and our services are far less than having to send skilled workers there, you know, yeah. and disrupt the workflow. But in addition to that, if we have the right assessment, we can have the right treatment. So even though you may have back or neck pain, it will see if your foot posture is altered. So we're the next part of our, our services that we're going to be offering in a couple of weeks, hopefully, is a treatment platform. So after you get an assessment, you'll have a customized treatment plan that is also created by our AI according to your deficits and what you need. So you can do it whenever you want, however you want. You don't have to disrupt your workday. 
And so the benefit of that is we give people the, the access to that knowledge whenever they want and they can execute it however they want. There's no, no barriers that you would see needing to schedule with somebody, um, needing to do it on a specific time. You have to wait till somebody analyzes you. And anytime you take another picture, it will update your treatment plan accordingly. So in my opinion, that's, that's the future of healthcare is AI-driven healthcare, where we take a lot of the, uh, where we automate as much as possible to allow people to have the health and the, the, um, the solutions whenever they need it. And that's the world we live in now is instant solutions. So we got to be able to give people the help that they need right when they need it, rather than scheduling something next month. You know, right. that really doesn't work because your pain or problem may be insignificant or 10 times worse by the time um, you're able to see somebody. But um, what do you say to people who are skeptical about this kind of AI-led um, medical intervention, you know? Um, yeah. So talk to me about how it works. So I've tested the app. Um, I logged mm -hmm. on uh, this morning. I, I, tried, I tried it. How... Talk to me about how it actually works. Uh, so two things for the skeptical people. What I found is that the most skeptical people are actually the one in, in our profession. You know, so my peers rather than the people, because when you tell somebody, hey, for a couple dollars a month, you can have help and solutions whenever you need it. They're like, fantastic. None of them want to go in clinics. None of them want to go in hospitals. They don't want to schedule. They don't want to use their insurance. It takes away all the barriers that they don't even care. So number one, it satisfies that. Um, and in regards to the peers, a lot of them feel like, well, we can't, that they, we can't supplement a lot of what they do with AI. But what I'm trying to tell a lot of them is that uh, I'm, I'm interested in collaborating, not to replace them. Because they're, like I said before, there's like 170 million Americans that have muscle and joint pain. And we only have about 250,000 licensed uh, physical therapists. And only about 4% of them are specialists in musculoskeletal care. So if you do the math, it's like, well, each patient's going to have like, uh, what is it? Like if you go to a specialist, you'll have like 70,000 patients you need to treat. That's insane. You can't do that. So yeah. the, the, um, the supply is so low and the demand is so high that we need to do something about it. So yeah. regardless of how people feel, there is no other solution. Technology is a solution. So the better we can utilize it, the better we can help people. So even if they don't agree and they're skeptical, uh, everybody's skeptical of new things. That just tells me that we're ahead of the curve and we're doing the right things. Because if, if everybody wasn't skeptical, we'd already be doing it. So my goal is to pull the future into the present and help as many people as possible. And people who are skeptical will see eventually, everybody in their due time, they'll see that it's, uh, it's relevant and then they'll jump on board as well too there is really no choice at, at this time especially with covid's taught us that that we need technology because we can help everybody the way we need to help everybody without it yeah so i i was one of those people where you know i was just ideologically opposed to anything ai <laughs> like mm -hmm. i even had the same thing with um with you know seeing meta launch and all of this stuff and i really because I, I come at it from a mom's perspective where i just think what is the future going to be for our children i just find myself get very african suddenly <laughs> so yeah, it's, it is scary. Like yeah. yeah believe me I, i'm inside of it creating technology and it and it's scary I, it's it's overwhelming and but when i look at it i was like well this is this is the way the world is going and if I have a chance to shape it, then, then I want to be involved in it because the way I look at it is that it's a very powerful tool and powerful things can either create or destroy. And unfortunately, the nature of us is that we like to destroy a lot of things. Um, yeah. But my, my intention with it is to create something beautiful with it. Yeah. So that is where I'm putting my effort is in. So even though it's going to come with a lot of negatives, there's still a lot of beautiful, powerful things that we can do with it. So my intention is to be one of those, uh, be one of those positive, powerful things inside of it. And, and so it, it can be a little bit difficult to, to wrap your head around because it is scary, but uh, there's a lot of beautiful things we can do with it. And in regards to like how our AI works is that, uh, so first our AI is called Cairo, which yeah. is actually the name of uh, my son. 
A little too soon. Oh, yeah. yeah so, and he's about the same age as my son, too. <laughs> you know, so I feel like um, I'm training him as well, too. Uh, but right now, the, he uses image capture. So when you take, a, you enter some pain points, and then you take a picture. And I've created, I've put in all of the logic inside of the algorithm. So when it sees your picture, it can determine the stress points on your body. And as a result, it can correlate that to your risk of injury. And um, eventually, like, like I said before, we'll create treatments based on that. So with this technology, I can help people treat not only the pain points, like your low back, but if your feet are involved, uh, the, the image capture will capture that as well. And it will give you uh, treatment plans to address all of those things. So we can therefore treat the criminal and the victim rather than just having this reactive care. And it, it puts us in a position where we can do preventative care. It makes prevention a reality because we can see problems coming, mm -hmm. you know, and, and rather than waiting till somebody gets hurt to come in the door, Cairo can go out and be with anybody at any time all over the world and tell them if a problem is coming and at what risk they have to injure themselves. So that way they can uh, do something before it becomes a devastating, debilitating problem, which becomes more costly and time consuming to, to address. Right. You know what? First of all, I absolutely love that you named it after your son. And such yeah, a beautiful you. name. I was actually, um, when I was testing the app, I was, you know, I was saying Cairo, but I just thought it was an acronym for something. Well, it is as well, too. Oh, it is. Oh. <laughs> so it works as twofold. Yeah, it's a, a comprehensive artificial intelligence rehab operator. Oh. So it works in both ways. Brilliant. And was he by any chance mm. born in, in Cairo, in Egypt? No, no, he was born in the U.S. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, us being Egyptian, we, we wanted to, you know, give him you know, attachment to his lineage as well, too. Oh, and it's funny, everybody awesome. loves a name, but then a lot of Egyptians are like, ah, you know, <laughs> they have their opinions on, on you know, their home, homeland. So, yeah. but a lot of them, uh, they've grown to love it now as well. Oh, it's so beautiful. Um, I don't know if I talked to, I told you the last time. I went to Egypt. I went to on holiday to Sharm el Sheikh when I was pregnant with my daughter. And uh, there were so many ladies there who were constantly rubbing my belly and, um, you know, praying over me. And it was so beautiful. When my daughter was around four or five, she discovered Egypt and just loved it. And so I kind of linked it to that. And I was like, you know what? Because they prayed for you. And, you know, we just have such yeah. an affinity for Egyptians in Egypt. Um, yeah, thank you. It really is a special place. It, it's, the history is beautiful. And it's taught me a lot about you know, especially ancient Egypt, when you look at how they lived their lives and what they did, it's, uh, it's really inspiring to, to live properly now. Yeah, no, we, we, we were going to go um, in the last two years, but we haven't been able, it's definitely still on my, um, on my list of places yeah. to visit with her. Um, uh, another thing I really want to ask you about is old age. So old people, um, they have specific more musculoskeletal issues, right? Um, how does uh, this yeah, help them? Okay, so well, there's there's a, a few different thoughts I have around that okay. um, because I've worked with the elderly population as well too, and and whenever I I get their history, and then I I deal with somebody who's maybe a teenager, mm -hmm. uh, their history matches what that teenager is currently doing. So it's like you can see that person's future. You know, so it's really been very insightful. So that's why with this type of prevention app, especially with it being technology, which a lot of the youth are more savvy with, that I'm hoping to get somebody healthy enough when they're younger and, and create the awareness with, with our technology that they don't have to be those uh, older people who have chronic problems that have plagued them for years. So number one is like to prevent the, us having problems when we're older, it starts when we're young. And a right. lot of them, I remember I was working with somebody who was um, in their early 90s and they made a comment. I'm showing them simple things and they're like, how come nobody ever showed me this? I was like, wow, can you imagine living 90 years and hearing something for the first time? You know, that's surprising, especially a simple concept. You know, so I found that it's like, well, we just need education to prevent it. If you prevent things, it's so much easier. But then in regards to the elderly um, population, they have a lot of chronic problems. And unfortunately, if you go to a uh, physical therapist in the U.S., we can only treat whatever's on the prescription. 
So we're very limited and we can't help people the way we need to. Their visits are limited, but with this type of care, they can have ongoing maintenance and manage their problems a lot better. So there is no limitation to how many times you can analyze your posture, how many times you can do the assessments on the app. Um, but of course, they may not be as tech savvy, but a lot of them typically have caretakers or people around them who can help them and guide yeah. them. And they all want to know, what can I do on my own? Because yeah. even if they are receiving help, maybe it's only once a week or twice a week for a couple of weeks. And the question is, well, what do you do when nobody's around? So this creates a treatment plan for them that can be dynamic and be customized to whatever they need at that point in time. So it just gives them another option and, and versatility. And that's really the key of this is that if you're not getting skilled help with somebody, you really don't have another option. You're mm -hmm. left to your own devices. And if you don't have the education understanding, then unfortunately you're not gonna get any care. So with our platform, you can have as much care as you need, you know, whenever you need it. So it just provides another tool to maintain your health that doesn't currently exist. And it's something that is really needed. And it solves a lot of the barriers of people who currently uh, need help. And so like what you're saying about, you know, education early on and what do you, first of all, what are the kind of things that are specific to children that you're finding? Oh, so a lot of children, they have the dysfunction, like, so they'll sprain their ankle, like most of them don't have pain. And honestly, I, it's their neurological systems aren't quite as mature yet. But in addition to that, they don't have experience with the pain. So they may not be aware, they lack a, a lot of awareness to what's happening with their body doesn't mean they're not suffering. Um, so with kids, it's really teaching them uh, how their body works. Okay. You know, and, and we're taught so many things, but nobody teaches us how to use this. Imagine when you first um, are learning to drive a car and you take your driver's ed test, right? They, they make sure that you know how to use all the parts of the car, how to drive it, how to do all the things with it. We don't have anything like that for our body. Right. So if somebody teaches you um, just how your body works, what are good postures, how it moves, and you can start identifying what works well, what doesn't work well. And so you can see problems coming before you get injured or you start to have pain because their bodies are youthful. So uh, they're easy to fix. Mm -hmm. So you want to fix them. You want to fix their dysfunction at an early age. Even my son, for example, right. he has some jaw dysfunction. He? Uh, he's a little over two. Okay. And so when he was first born, um, when he came out of the pregnancy, his, his head was a little misshaped. So it affected his jaw. And because of that, he wasn't able to latch on properly to breastfeed. So um, it was very difficult. He wasn't, he was taking in a lot of air, very colicky, throwing up often. We took him to the chiropractor. She manipulated his jaw and then like instantly he stopped grinding his teeth and the breastfeeding was, was great. My wife wasn't suffering any like wounds or anything like that around her nipple, you know, um, all the scabs that come with him biting down. Yes. So that, that shows you that he didn't have pain, but he had dysfunction. So I want to teach kids how to recognize dysfunction. And if you treat that, then you can prevent pain. Oh my God, it literally took me back. I had the same exact issues with my daughter, but I didn't even think that it might be related to that. I just assumed that kids don't know how to latch on properly and it takes a while and all of that. Yeah, and that may be true for some of them, but then we, we can't be blind to the fact that there may be some dysfunction. And, and if things are dysfunctional, they don't work right. So whenever you have a child who maybe runs funny, walks on their toes, instead of uh, you just thinking, oh, that's part of their youth, it should be important that we realize that, oh, they're just not using their bodies right. And then you have to ask yourself, why? Do, they need, do we have to do something to them so their body works properly? Or do they just need some education and awareness? Either way, they need some intervention to wake them up for what they're doing. You know, and then once you, and they're easy to fix. So you, you tweak them a little bit and then they're good to go. But if you wait till they're uh, much older, it, their body has um, become more solid and uh, locked in place and it's harder to change. I always think of it like those trees that you plant, you know, how they always have the, the wooden poles next to them to guide how they grow. Yes. But once the tree is fully grown, uh, you're not gonna change its shape. Yeah. It's a lot harder. Right. Yeah, yeah. so, so that's, that's the way, so rather than trying to fix those trees once they've grown fully developed, we need to start when they're young and make sure that they're on the right path. That way, if they start to deviate, they become aware of it and they understand their own body. 
and they can come to you and tell you, oh, this doesn't work right. And all, that's what all my patients do now. They've become so independent and they understand so much that they call me and tell me what I need to do for them because they're so educated about themselves now. Wow. And so what do you do for that? So, you know, obviously we, we don't all have access to Dr. Armia, you know? <laughs> So oh, that's app. what the app is for. <laughs> yeah. So with the app, for example, I'm going to test it during the beta phase. Um, I would, I will encourage uh, everybody that's listening to test it out for themselves. Um, yeah, but you. say, let's say for children, they just have to kind of assume that posture with their hands out, right? Yes. For, and that's a unique thing about children because they won't have any pain to input typically. But, um, but one of the things I put in there is pain and dysfunction. You know, so if anything is dysfunctional, of course, you'd give that a score as well. But we can analyze their posture, and the posture can tell us everything about them. So if their posture is asymmetrical, offset, we know that there's stress on their body. Enough repetition with that type of stress, then eventually they're going to start to be symptomatic. So with kids, they can follow the same treatment plans um, and do the same things. But if they're not interested in doing like uh, doing that, then if they're getting help, if they're getting uh, – if like a lot of kids, if they're in sports, they have coaches, trainers, then all you have to do is take that report to them and say, hey, can you work on my right leg? Can you work on my left arm? So it doesn't have to be our treatment plan. That's what's beautiful about the analysis is that it will tell you what's wrong with you and then you can go seek any type of help. So what we're just trying to do is also give you another option of um, creating a treatment plan for people so they can also have that as one of the options to get help. But it can be it can be anything that um, or anyone that can help them. But the analysis creates the awareness and helps you identify the problem. Right. So let's say, for example, you've had surgery on your knee. I'm using myself as an example. And sometimes now I can feel because I had a cartilage removed when I was, you know, like 17. Um, and now sometimes I can feel if I do the wrong thing, if I exercise the wrong way. Um, that the knee actually almost feels like it's moving in the socket. I don't even know if I'm saying the right things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then I kind of have to, I've learned to kind of do a little bit of squats and ease off and strengthen the area around it. I'm taking supplements. Um, like, you know, uh, my neighbor suggested, <laughs> my neighbor is my physio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I, <laughs> she suggested um, get you know, help wherever you can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a physiotherapist. Mm -hmm. um, so I, she suggested omegas and vitamin E. I have no idea if she's right, but I've tried that. And sometimes I feel like my knee is getting better. And then there are other times like, you know, when I, I tried to do this, this famous YouTuber uh, that has knee stuff. When I do it, it goes all wrong for me. <laughs> Well, that's, that's a unique thing is that, okay, so all the things you're talking about are making your knee more resilient. And so think of that like um, you're putting money in the bank, but for some reason money's flying out, you know, and, and typically that's going to come from another body part. And like we were talking about before, the feet, if you have high arches and they're not really mobile, that means every time you take a step, uh, you're going to, uh, you, you're going to lack some ability to absorb shock in your feet. And who's next in line? the knee is next in line to absorb the shock. And if the cushion was damaged, that all that tells us to make it simple is that your knee, um, its ability to absorb stress, it, it's been overwhelmed. And as a result, one of the structures that absorb stress got compromised and damaged. So rather than making your knee able to tolerate more stress, we have to figure out how do we take the stress out of the knee and put it to the other body parts that need to absorb it. And that's where typically the feet will come in and probably even the other foot. Because if you're, for example, if it's your right knee that hurts, well, your left foot, you should push off your toe and you should land well on your heel. If you don't push off well, you land a little hard. And that stress becomes cumulative. And that's why sometimes your pain is better. Sometimes it's worse. So your knee pain has little to do with your knee. Of course, you have to do the right things to, to put out the fire in your knee. But if you're not getting quick results, that means you're not treating, it, the precision is not there. We're not treating the right thing. We're just treating the thing that gets affected. We're treating the victim. So uh, for your case, I would, I would look at your feet or I tried the, um, the postural analysis mm -hmm. and see what it says about your feet or even your other leg. 
And if your other leg is deficient, then that's where we start having to do some work on that side because knee problems like you're describing is overuse. So something is being underused and we want to go after that body part. Right. So when, the way the app has been so far for me is you go on it and it's asking you to jump around. Is it because it's testing your feet? Does oh, it? no, it asks you to march in place yes, and to get your, your posture settled in. So the purpose of that is because if you just stand there, you may be like in a compromised position. But what we're trying to get is uh, your resting posture. So when you march in place, you take a couple steps and then you stop. Typically, you'll settle in to what your chronic posture is. And that's what we really want to analyze. We don't want to analyze you affecting your posture or trying to cheat it. You know, we just want to see what do you look like at rest with a snapshot. And by marching in place, it helps you settle into that position. Right. Okay. And then once you've settled in, that's when you say Cairo and the, it, it takes your, it takes It'll take your, your picture. It takes your picture. And then what is it? What happens then? Uh, immediately wow. after it'll populate a report. So you'll get a grid of your body and it'll show you the percent health of all the different regions of your body. Um, and over time, as we get more precise, it will not only show you your leg health, but your hip, your knee and your foot health. And, and, and then it gives you a little grid that shows you what those scores mean. And then underneath that, it tells you all the different risk of injuries for all of those regions and what are some of the common uh, injuries that people get. So it, it's very informative. And then eventually, uh, in a couple of weeks, what we're going to do is create the treatment plan in addition to that. So after you get that report, they'll say, okay, do these things. And then you can do those things for about a week or so and then take your picture again. And if your health is improved, it will uh, reconfigure those exercises. So it's a dynamic exercise plan that goes along with, uh, with your posture. So the idea is if you get everything over 80%, your risk of injury goes down dramatically. And so it's a way to manage and monitor uh, your progress. It's kind of like a, a weight scale when you're trying to lose weight, right? It tells you, did I do something good? Was it bad? Did it yeah. work? Did it not work? So yeah. it, it just helps you... Um, uh, with just a picture, inform you about how you're doing. And then you can look at all your history of your scores to see if you're trending up or trending down. Mm -hmm. So it creates a lot of awareness and you can realize, okay, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? Without needing to go to somebody to tell you these things. Yeah. Um, we've talked about weight. Um, do you think there are certain uh, musculoskeletal issues that are specific to people who are overweight and then those that are underweight? Uh, yes, typically the ones that are underweight, especially if they're um, elderly, it's like um, they're more prone to breaking things if they fall. There's no cushion. <laughs> so that's just a, a physical protection. But when you're underweight, if you're very underweight, you could be malnutrition. And especially for a woman that looks like osteoporosis, osteopenia, so you can break things a little bit easier. Mm. If you're overweight, that just increases the stress load on your body. So typically being overweight and underweight, it doesn't really make or break whether or not you have a problem. It only amplifies it, mm. you know, because it's just additional stress on top of some already postural stress that you have. So the way I look at them is typically they're amplifiers, you know, and they will make a problem worse okay 